Despierta. ¿Sabes qué día es hoy? Vas a transformar al mundo haciendo lo que amas. Vas a cambiar las reglas del juego. Vas a mover a otros. Busca, crea, innova, vuela. El mundo te espera. Transformalo. Hazlo UPAEP. Muy buenas tardes, ya. Muchas gracias a los que nos están acompañando, tanto en presencial como en línea. Disculpen un par de demoras. Hoy tuvimos una interrupción en la red que duró un buen rato. Y pues creo que nos está trazando todo desde la vista hasta todo sí. el Pero pues hoy tenemos el gusto de tener con nosotros al doctor Daniel Reyes Cárdenas colaborador aquí en la UPAED, un PhD en filosofía, profesor asistente de filosofía en la UPAED y un investigador honorario en la Universidad de Sheffield, en el Reino Unido. De hecho, hemos tenido el gusto de tener aquí al doctor Herbert eh, presentando también estos temas relacionados con la comunidad. Y pues creo que en esta semana ha estado muy presente en la universidad el concepto de la comunidad que queremos crear y cómo todos nosotros somos parte de ello y pues creo que nos va a ser de, de mucho beneficio pues, escuchar, reflexionar y comprender sobre estos temas. Les recordamos que estamos por videoconferencia, si tienen alguna pregunta que quieran hacer, pues con empujar el botoncito se vuelve a ver de la luz, nos escuchan todos de la misma manera para los que están acompañándonos remotamente. Eh, Simplemente para no andar distrayendo en la sala, pediríamos tener la video y el micrófono apagadas, pero si tienen una pregunta que hacer, pueden hacerla con el audio, con el audio y video, o escribiendo al chat y estaremos monitoreando ahí. Muchas gracias, doctor. Gracias. Ok, bueno, pues, eh, solo comprobar, ¿se escucha bien eh, en línea? Sí, ¿verdad? Sí, no lo he destruido todavía. Ok. I'm going to do the switch to English now, if that's all right. Okay, well, um, well, uh, just a word of thanks to everybody for being here, coming and attending to this talk. Uh, the purpose of the talk is to present what it says in the title, which is uh, Semiotic Theory of Community. Basically, expanding and um, having a little bit of uh, considerations and reflections on Royce's, Josiah Royce's, idea of community. I will explain a little bit uh, further down the road what is, uh, who is Josiah Royce and why is he important in order to uh, uh, develop and shape a nice and well-rounded concept of community. Now, this is very interesting because what I'm per the purpose of this uh, talk is not only to present a theory of community that uh, actually emerges from the study of semiotics, but also a theory of community that is not uh, reduced to soci sociological events. It's not that I'm saying how communities are, which is basically the descriptive work of so sociology, but also how communities ought to be, or what is the principle that makes possible the human phenomenon of or community. In other words, giving us so, some sort of metaphysics of community, which is surprisingly enough, this, is, this hasn't been worked before. And one of the few people who actually delved into these kind of problems was Rosa, Josiah Royce. Well, uh, but um, just um, a word of, like, like I said, a word of thanks for the acceptation of my proposal for this talk, uh, especially to Juan Manuel Olexby. Thanks ever so much. And like he said, this talk is a continuation of a project that was actually presented here in its beginnings by Professor Dan Herbert from the University of Sheffield. Uh, and we, we both uh, work in these topics and we presented uh, just the principles of communities of inquiry according to the pragmatist tradition. So what I'm gonna do now is actually I'm going to summarize a little bit of what he presented that time, which is about less than a year by now. I think it was the, principle, the, the beginnings of this year, right? When he came to this very forum of e ideas and presented, and presented uh, the beginnings of this theory. But actually, I'm just going to do a, a little summary of that just to have a, a, a common point of departure. And then my purpose is to uh, have a little bit 
more time um, profounding on Royce's ideas. So that's the, that's the purpose of the talk. Hopefully, I'll do it in less than 40 minutes. <laughs> I have 30 slides or so, so hopefully it won't be too long, and I won't uh, I won't tire you to death. Okay. So the summary of the talk is we we're going to start talking, summarizing what. Uh, Dan presented us here uh, a few months ago. Uh, we're going we, we're gonna to start off by um, talking about the founder of pragmatism, which is a philosopher and American polymath called Charles Sanders Peirce. Uh, secondly, we, we, we will examine a little bit of how Peirce's pragmatism, Peirce's ideas, influence Royce in two fronts. First and foremost, with pragmatism, the idea of pragmatism, which allegedly is the, or the, 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 the only uh, current of thought that is uh, um, uniquely from, from, from the American continent. And obviously it's a distinctive American brand of thought, but unfortunately it's a very spread, uh, mis uh, there's a lot of spread misunderstandings about what, what pragmatism is. So this, is, this will be important to explain what pragmatism is and how pragmatism is important as a as an American contribution to the human the, 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 the thought the, the traditions and the histories of philosophy in the history of humanity. Uh, then I'm going to move on to Royce's influence. Sorry, Royce's uh, reception of Peirce's ideas on semiotic. Now, semiotics is a theory of science, and because of that, we will have a very brief introductory study of what semiotics is about. So I won't go ahead of myself, but I'd like to just to say that. And then we will move on uh, what Royce identified as the semiotic principle of community, how communities are formed. And he gives us a he, he gives us an epistemological and epistemological sorry, epistemological and metaphysical theory of how communities are shaped. By the way, just as a little advert, we just got published this um, this uh, collection, edited collection called uh, I don't know if it, probably if it's visible uh, for our friends on online, but um, yep, just the advert of saying that some of this work has been already published in this collection that I did with um, Simone Marquez Serdan, who is a student of here of UPAF of the undergrad on education and some other students of education that uh, had, a, had a time to explain and expand these ideas of community on their own. So it was a very exciting project and one of the fruits of this project of research is, is that book and it's available free online. I'll, I'll give you the details later. Um, for, um, and then the last bit of the talk will be talking about loyalty, which is, according to Royce, the principle that actually binds communities. So communities are bonds, are bound by, by um, a principle that is both metaphysical and ethical, which is loyalty. And we will explain that later on. So these are our two uh, subjects today, the big very generous beard of this man on the left is Charles Sanders Peirce. This is one of the few photos that we have of him. So when, whenever you Google Peirce, probably that, that image will come across. Uh, according to my student, Simone, he was very good looking when he was uh, young, but the beard doesn't help. So <laughs> I should probably listen. Anyway, on the left hand side, um, we have Josiah Royce in one of his uh, also, we don't have many photos of him, but this is one of the surviving ones. And this one is the one that you could find if you went to uh, the University of Harvard uh, in the Houghton Library. That will be the, a frame that we will come across. Um, nobody really knows who he is, but uh, he's actually at, at the front of the first aisle in the Houghton Library in Harvard. Let's talk about Peirce first, then. Uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, like I said, is a polymath. He's the, the mo most greatest ever American thinker. And it's not only my opinion. It's, it's, the, it's the generalized opinion of many important uh, 
relevant thinkers of our, our time and before, one of the people who actually praised his work and didn't actually quite know it very well was Bertrand Russell, for example, a public, public intellectual. But unfortunately, Peirce uh, was uh, very neglected in his own time. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't very, uh, um, other than intellectual circles, he wasn't very much um, uh, attended in his philosophy. And he wrote an, an awful lot of materials that weren't available, because all, the only materials available during his lifetime were a few articles that he published in not very spread out journals. So that's why um, you probably haven't heard much of Peirce. But his um, work is, is prominent because he started the philosophical tradition known as pragmatism. Now, uh, before going into what his philosophy or the core tenets of his philosophy say, I would like to say just a, f a quick word of what pragmatism is in it, what pragmatism is not. Um, so when people say, oh, you are acting in a pragmatic manner, they normally want to say that you are using other person or you, you, you're, you're taking the other person as means or, the, or taking institutions as means for your uh, uh, utilitarian purposes. But actually, the meaning of pragmatism is nothing further, to, uh, not, nothing close to that, actually. It's, it's, it, it, could be, it couldn't be anything as further as that, as pragmatism, because pragmatism is a, is a doctrine about meaning. And I'll explain what the, what, what the pragmatist maxim, which is the principle that we're, from where pragmatism emerges, uh, gives, gives, gives away uh, a body of philosophical doctrines. So that's why I'm going to explain in a minute. But just to say very clearly, pragmatism is not utilitarianism. Being pragmatic doesn't mean, does not mean by any means that um, we want to, to put usefulness first and then uh, get, uh, give things importance or give truth importance according to our uh, uh, selfish or, in, or particular interest. So just, just what pragmatism is not. Uh, now, like I said, Peirce was credited for founding the pragmatist philosophy, which is a body of doctrines, like I said, that emerges from the pragmatic maxim. And the pragmatic maxim says that we must look to the practical implications of our terms in order to understand what they mean. If two terms, for example, do not differ in practical practical implications, then their, then their meanings are the same. Hence, Peirce's pragmatism is concerned with clarifying meanings. Let me just explain this very quickly. There's a seminal paper that Peirce published in 1878, which is called How to Make Our Ideas Clear. And in this paper, Peirce explains us that we have, um, that pragmatism is meant to be a principle a logical principle that helps us to clarify our concepts, intellectual concepts, in a further way than what philosophy has given us so far. Let me explain what he means about that. Well, what, what Peirce is trying to explain us is that traditional modern philosophy explains us that in order to get clarity about our concepts, we must distinguish our concepts from another concepts. And secondly, uh, we must be able to define them. But then again, it, it is important to clarify that a concept can be clarified backwards if we can identify it and not mistake one thing from the other. And it also be, it ca can be clarified by a definition, but that is not everything that is to it. For example, um, I don't know if, 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 I mean, I'm not a very practical man. Uh, Juan, Juan Manuel will correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if uh, so, maybe actually this this concept will apply very nicely to me because I'm not a very practical one. So uh, if if we have plumber issues in in the house, for example, in 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 my house when when I have a problem with a with a tap, um, I really don't know what to do. You know, <laughs> like I I feel like if I touch anything, it's going to explode or it's going to break. <laughs> So what I do is go straight to see the 
I have a little box of um, tools, and when I open when I open the box with the tools, I, I find different tools with different shapes. And I could say that I have a modern philosophy kind of clarity for those tools because I can identify that a hammer is not the same as a drill. Uh, and, and that's the beginning. Uh, at least I don't confound when I when somebody says pass me the hammer, I don't pass the the, the mesh, for example. So that's a first degree of clarity. But then, if you ask me to define them, perhaps I could be able to define them, and I can say, well, the hammer is a thing that is has a handle and then it has a head, and, the, and then the head is very hard or something like that. But of course, that doesn't mean that I know how to use the hammer. And basically, that's what the pragmatic maxim gives us, reflective clarity on the practical consequences that will follow if we, if, if we accept some meaning to a, to a symbol. Particularly, for example, if I talk about a, a tool like a hammer, I can describe it, I can distinguish it from another tool, but uh, it doesn't mean that I know the practical use of that hammer. So, for example, I could use the hammer just to hammer the tap and try to do it over and over again, but probably that won't help me to solve my problem with the tap. So, um, it is important to derive, the ref in order to have full clarity of a concept, we need also to be able to, to explain how uh, practical bearings follow from accepting that concept. And per se, is that this is the same for any given concept of intellectual nature. And that's why the, the pragmatic maxim is, is here to give us some clarity about some terms. And Peirce used it for every kind of term, but uh, I'm, not, I'm afraid I don't have the time to explain many of these interesting uh, issues that he, he explained there. But we could just name a few, if, if that's all right. So what, what does it mean to call something hard, for example? Let's clarify with the pragmatic maxim the concept, the concept hard. That it means basically that it will normally resist force applied by other objects and not display signs of scratching, for instance. So that will be a practical bearing that will follow from accepting that an object is hard. Let's say, for example, if I say marble is hard, it means that I shouldn't use marble, for example, to sleep because it will, it will display some practical bearings. Okay? It will be possible to sleep in, 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 a, in, in, a, in a mat of marble, yes, but it will be very uncomfortable indeed. So basically, no, don't do it. What does it mean to say, for example, that an assertion is true? This is another fascinating concept. I don't have much time to explain it, but at least I, I, can, I can mention that the concept of truth uh, is, a, is a, a concept that was clarified by the pragmatists. And the first one who did this was Charles Peirce. But then someone who followed these steps of Peirce in clarifying pragmatically the concept of truth was William James. Uh, and William James really devoted a, 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 you know, a huge deal of writings and conferences to explain how the concept of, tr concept of truth can be clarified with, the pra with pragmatism. And it means that, that it is something upon which people would agree where they are aware of all the relevant information. So for example, that's a pragmatic definition of truth. So if you see the traditional definition of truth, well, the Aristotle, Aristotle for example, in Metaphysics uh, Book 2, he says that the truth of something is the correspondence between that object and, and the proposition. So if a proposition says, for example, the wall, the, 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 the board is green, okay? The board is green. Well, that is true if the proposition, the board is green, and the board uh, correspond because it describes an actual fact. But there is, that's not everything that is uh, to do with truth because that's just a definition that captures the present moment about that truth proposition. That true proposition is all right. We, we can also check it. But if we wanted, for example, to do scientific inquiry, what we want to do is to find truths that we actually don't have. So if we want to find a true uh, proposition that we don't have, 
then we need to gather the relevant information and we need to do it in some sort of exercise of a community and then we will end up believing what we aimed what we hope to be the truth so in a way a pragmatic definition of truth gives us what will not only what is true now but what we want to be true in the future and finally what does it mean for example to say that something is real you know reality is one of these philosophical terms that I don't want to bore you with but reality is, is a fascinating term because um, you know um, how, how can we know how can we know that this reality is the only one or what is the structure of reality is there any, stru any structure to reality or for example this side of reality and the side outside do they have the same laws why no so um, in, in asking these kind of questions, uh, a pragmatic clarification of reality says that something is real if it's the object of a true assertion, as simple as that. So it helps us, it helps us to capture what reality uh, offers us as something that is basically independent of uh, our, our idiosyncratic ways of believing things. So for example, if I didn't want to believe that this wall is real, uh, reality, if I want to cross it, reality is going to resist me. <laughs> you see? Reality is resisting me. And because of that, we can say that reality is something that is independent of our idiosyncratic ways of believing things. And this is a pragmatic way of clarifying the concept of reality. So true assertions are a sign of real objects, for example. Now. Let's move very quickly, swiftly, hopefully, into Peirce's semiotics and his theory of science. Peirce maintains that all thought, all thinking, is in science. And let's do a, a quick experiment. Try to think in something, anything, whatsoever. What do you think about? Coffee. Perfect. I thought you were thinking about your book here. Because <laughs> I have her book here. <laughs> She's thinking about coffee, okay? So anything whatsoever that you could think about can be expressed in a sign because thoughts are signs of things, you know? And if, if we say, I, you know, there's no sign for the thought I'm having at this moment. Well, even talking about a thought that without a sign is making a sign for that thought. So in a way, there's nothing that could not be expressed by a sign if it's a thought, okay? So uh, that clarifies that all thinking happens in science. And therefore it stresses the importance of understanding how science operates. If we want to understand the nature of thought, then we need to understand the nature of science. And secondly, well, the second, the first, um, the first uh, contribution of Peirce that we are taking on account in this talk is the pragmatic maxim. But the second one that we are concerned with today is a science, a system of sci a science that he invented to systematize our way of thinking with science. And this is called semiotic. Interpretation then is an essential, sorry, if we want to understand the nature of thought, then we need to understand the nature of science. And interpretation is an essential feature of the sign relation. Every sign requires interpretation. Finally, there are three ba basic kinds of signs according to their object, which are icons, indices, and, sign and symbols. Let me very briefly, this, these slides, by the way, uh, uh, I just took them literally from, um, from Dan's presentation, because I just wanted to build on, up on the same ground, okay? But the second part is different, because it explains how this applies to Royce's tool. So, very quickly. Every sign involves basically three features, three traits. The first one is the, the sign itself. So for example, a road sign. Second one is that of which it is a sign, for example, the object of the sign. Uh, so for example, a sign could be a road sign that tells speed limits is 40 miles per hour, okay? So it means that what, 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 what the sign represents is something which is what is represented, which is a meaning, we call representamen. And finally, that by which the sign is interpreted as being a sign of its object, 
the interpretant of the sign. So for example, the thought and behavior of a driver. So just to summarize that example, if I'm driving and I see a sign that says 40, I interpret I interpret that if I'm in the in the UK or in the US, for example, as 40 as a speed limit of 40 miles per hour. And then what I have to do if I'm 50 miles per hour, I have to brake, put the brakes, which means that I interpreted the sign. So basically, a sign follows the rules of pragmatism because is you know that you understood what a sign means if you actually do what the sign does, tell you to. So we can put it in this way by saying that X is a sign of Y for Seth, or Seth interprets X as a sign of Y, or Y is signified to Seth by X, etc. So what we're doing here is just basically defining the three elements of the sign relationship, which are namely the sign itself, the object that represents the sign, which is called representamen, and finally, an interpretant, somebody who uh, interprets the sign. Uh, I'm not going to delve too much on this because obviously this has its own complexity, but I don't want you to be too distracted by it. So I'm putting the same example that Dan put the, the, the other, in the other presentation, which is a sign relation. So for example, here is the sign. This is sign is not so common in Mexico, which is, which is uh, <laughs> dogs crossing the road, which I find interesting because it's good to have us a, an unacquainted sign for us because it helps us to, to think about signs. And then we, if we see something like that, we, somebody has to interpret that it has to be careful by crossing the road and not stem it to the poor dogs. Look at them, they're so, so sweet and cute. And this interpreter, which is actually a photo that Dan gave us of um, Thomas H. Green, which is a British philosopher, and um, looks like a very interpreting man, like very, very, with very stern face. So basically, Peirce distinguishes between three different kinds of signs according to different manners in which they signify the objects. Uh, so the three kinds of signs are icons, indices, and symbols. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to um, explain each of them. But I'd like you to identify that there are three cl classes of signs according to their object that will help us to understand what Roy says about communities. Because um, communities are bound by a sign, particular kind of sign according to Roy's, which is loyalty. I'm just, I'm going to say that towards the end, but actually, but I'd like you to know that uh, the, 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 the sign of loyalty that binds communities is both an icon and an index and a symbol, which is a very interesting thing. We are running they out can, of time. No, no, they oh. can see Dr. Herbert's presentation on. Oh, on excellent! Yes, subjects. of course, and of course. On the YouTube channel, Dr. Herbert's presentation. Go, you know, for the time we don't have here. Excellent. That that's fantastic because that's perfect because it will help us to 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 move on onwards and and see what. Um, Royce adds up to this theory, okay? So there's an explanation for icons, example of icons. Icons are basically based on the resemblance with their object. Indices are causally produced by an object, uh, so a sign is produced by the object that it signifies. So for example, just, just a quick example, if you see there are potholes in the road, maybe you know you are in Puebla. No, I'm not, not just joking. <laughs> Just joking. That doesn't happen here. Friends looking at us in other countries, don't believe me. Symbols are signs that are established by convention. And that's another thing that is, it will be important to, to remember because, for example, languages are systems of symbols because they are established by convention. So, for example, the words of English book for book, uh, the word in Spanish, libro, um, Portuguese is the same libro. Uh, well, these, these, these words, um, or the German Buch, um, well, these all, all words that represent this, uh, the conventions for uh, uh, different signs, different symbols, but they have the same representation, the same meaning, for example. 
and when we when we translate symbols what we do is, is is move from a system of symbols to another system of symbols and this is very interesting for our future purposes because Roy says that what, when you understand yourself in a community you need to exchange symbols so there's no genuine symbol of, of an individual if you don't have a genuine community to understand yourself which is a very interesting thing anyway these are some examples of symbols they're just all all of them established by convention and obviously they're hybrid cases but now what we would like to think about remember that i said that the sign relation always has three elements um the first um element of the relation is the object itself then the representament and then the interpretant now um according to Peirce, an interpretant in, in, in our case, we represented the interpreter with the letter Seth, is itself a sign. So, for example, if I, if I remember five minutes ago when I was talking about um, an, a sign that represented an object for somebody, then if I tell this same person, Thomas H. Green, come back from the grave and tell us, do you remember when I asked you to think about the dogs crossing the road? Oh, yes, I remember that I was interpreting this. Oh, okay, and 10, minutes, 10 seconds later. Do you remember when I asked you about you remembering that? Yes, I remember myself interpreting what I was interpreting, etc. So basically, every interpretant is assigned to itself. But the inter interesting thing is that um, there's a limit to where the interpretant uh, can interpret to itself just in the one, in the one action of interpretation. So for example, if, if you ask me, what were you doing one hour ago? Well, I was in an interview, and you could ask me, uh, and what are you doing now? I'm telling you what I was doing an hour ago. And when I, what are you doing straight after that? Well, I'm thinking about you, uh, about you asking me to tell you what I was doing ten, one hour ago, etc. Et and this could go on infinitely. But the interesting thing is that I don't gather new relevant information if I just interpret myself in this self-feeding loop kind of way. Information grows if my interpretation of my own sign grows by having other interpretations that don't come from me. So that's why it's the first step to realize that a, a genuine interpretation of our individuality needs other people. We need others to understand ourselves. And this is, this is one important aspect that Perth himself realized because he was interested in uh, scientific inquiry. And because of that, while he was interested in scientific inquiry, what he wanted to achieve is a community of inquiry. And obviously that was the title of Dan's talk, Communities of Inquiry. But uh, Royce wants to go a little further than that and say, well, okay, this is very useful if we want to achieve agreement in science. If, so for example, the, the, the peer review referee is an example of constructing interpretation of new information in a systematic way. I send my paper to the journal, the journal has two blind referees that are experts in their subjects, and they, they're sent to them, they send their feedback, and, and, and so on, supposedly, the, the information grows in meaning and the community grows by interpreting new information. However, this is not the one and only use of the community of inquiry. Because the most important inquiry is what's the meaning of our presence in the community. In other words, what is my place in society? What am I doing here? What is my commitment to you? And because of that, the most important inquiry is inquiry into ourselves. I mean, the inquiry into our communities, the meaning of our communities. And because of that, the interpretant can carry on only if it has a community of interpreters, which is Royce's contribution to the, to the matter. 
So just summarizing, community and meaning. Because Peirce maintains that interpretants are themselves signs and need therefore to be interpreted, he thinks that a sign interpretation must be a collaborative effort stretching into the future. And making sense of our experiences for Peirce, a collective effort involving generations of community, communities of interpreters. Now, let's move very quickly to, into Royce. How, how, how am I doing with time? Um, am I, I still have about 20 minutes? Oh, perfect, perfect. First time in my life I'm doing, my, I'm doing the slides in good time. <laughs> yes, the, yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, so Josiah Royce. Josiah Royce is the first prominent uh, son of California as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a thinker. He was born in um, not far from what is um, Santa Barbara, California, nowadays. Uh, and he, he, his, his parents were very committed uh, members of a Christian community. And he had a, he, well, he has a very interesting life. But uh, amongst the interesting things that we have to say about him, he was the first his historian of California, and he was one of the first people to denounce the killing of of of, um, uh, a, of Mexican indigenous people in California, because um, in the Wild West, uh, it was allowed to it, it wasn't punished to kill local Mexicans uh, that were um, formerly part of the Mexican uh, country or the Spanish colonies. Uh, and one of the first people to actually develop a concern about this situation was Josiah Royce, and he wrote extensively on the topic. Uh, he was president of the, uh, one of the first presidents of the American Psychological Association, the AP, APA, etc. But he began his career as an idealistic philosopher. And one of the things that actually concerns us more is that he had a shift in his thought. He never, let, he never stopped being an idealistic philosopher, but he changed his idealism when he, uh, when he discovered uh, Peirce's semiotics. So in a way, he moved towards uh, Peirce's pragmatism and Peirce's semiotics by reading some of Peirce's papers but also by exchanging uh, letters with Peirce. Now, Peirce, like I, it must be said, he wasn't a very easy person to deal with. He was a very irrit irritable character, and he normally said things a, a little bit out of line, just as he thought. He wasn't very delicate in saying things. And one of the nasty things that he said to poor Josiah Royce when he published his first book of logic, which was called A Primer on Logic, he sent it to Peirce, dedicated to Peirce, and, say, and Peirce said to him, I think you should spend one year or two learning the basics of logic. <laughs> so you can see that he wasn't very... And, but, the, but, the, but the amazing thing to say, you know, the, the, the merit that we want to say about Royce is that after that he spent two years just devoting himself to study very deeply logic, and he actually came up with a very fascinating um, logical system, which is another issue but um, so you can see that this exchange wasn't easy but it was very fruitful anyway. Uh, he was influenced by Peirce in two respects that concern us, pragmatism and his semiotics and developed Peirce ideas to give meaning to the relationship of membership of a community and the use of signs uh, the sign, an E lacking there. So just just to start delving on Royce itself According to Royce, interpretation is essentially social because of the reasons we said before. It involves something like translation. So whenever I interpret somebody, it's a little bit as though I'm translating into my familiar languages what the person is doing. So for example, some of us that are not very good at social cues, uh, you know, we spend a, a, an awful lot of time trying to unwrap what's the meaning of that uh, not nothing attitude of somebody did to me. Was it ironical? Was it like approving? Was it? We really don't know sometimes. And what we're doing is we spend some time trying to translate in what is familiar to us. 
But of course, if I really wanted to come to the truth of what's going on, then I can go and speak to the person and say, like, what, what did you mean by that funny face that you did to me? Say, oh, approval. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> or I can go somewhere. Or suppose uh, a teenager wants to date somebody and he doesn't know how to interpret the signs. So what he does is goes to a good friend and asks, hey, what signs should I expect for? So, oh, well, if she does this, then you should be careful because the day is not going well. But if she does that, oh, then you're, you're, you're in for a, for a triumph. So we're, we're, we're always kind of translating each other's attitudes into signs. So basically, translation is not only about languages, like spoken languages, but also about every human conduct. We are interpreting each other at all times. So Royce uses the conversion of one currency into another to illustrate what goes on when people communicate with one another. Here is one set of signs and it's translated into another. In order to understand one another, we need to use symbols which are mutually understood. So interpretation both depends upon a help. Sorry, I, I missed something in my proposition there. Interpretation both depends upon the community and helps reinforce, depends upon and helps reinforce a community of mutual understanding. That's what I wanted to say. So, in other words, by interpreting each other, we form a community of mutual understanding. So, whenever I speak to somebody and we have a mutual understanding, there's an element of formation of a community of understanding, of meaning. All human progress depends upon communication between individuals and across generations. Hence, whatever else men need, says Royce, they need their communities of interpretation. Now, um, just to come back uh, to, the math, to the problem of pragmatism, Royce appropriated Peirce's pragmatic maxim, and he actually derived some interesting consequences. Uh, so, for example, some of the more important signs for communities uh, are the signs that give sense to life as a whole. In other words, metaphysical concepts. So, for example, the concept of, of God is an important sign. You know, Roy says to us, God may or may not exist, I don't know, but his sign is very important for the communities. Obviously, he defends that God, God does exist. Uh, our most basic beliefs are postulates that need to be translated into action. So for example, how do, I, how do you know that I believe in God? Royce will tell us, if you act as a God-fearing person. How do I believe that I believe in justice? If you behave as a just person, if you behave with justice in, our, in your endeavors. The disposition to transform our postulates in actions is called voluntarism. This is a particular, so that's why uh, Royce's pragmatism has been named as voluntarism, because it means that in order to transform some, some postulate into action, you need an exercise of your will. You really have to want to do it. In other words, Royce's system is an idealistic philosophy that is derived from, from Peirce's pragmatic maxim. Royce, however, emphasizes on the religious and social aspects of pragmatism, as well as William James did. Peirce didn't do so much about this topic. However, he has some interesting ideas that can be checked in, at least, for example, with the topic of God. Uh, he has some interesting ideas in a, a, in a paper called the Neglect A Neglected Argument for the Reality of God, for example. So Royce's pragmatism takes that all the core tenets of our beliefs are some kind of active postulates that are waiting for us to make them into actions. And these are the ones that form a community. Roy says, Peirce's concept of interpretation defines an extremely general process of which the Hegelian dialectical triad, triadic process is a very special case. So in a way, he's trying to say to us that Hegel, Hegel's philosophy can be subsumed into Peirce's system. So that's why he doesn't find contradiction on following an idealistic philosophy inspiring Hegel, partly, and subsuming 
including this, this philosophy into Peirce's system of science. As Roy sees it, the way in which these absolute idealists are true pragmatists is through their application of the dialectical method. So for example, according to this method, truth must always be related to action, to practice, to the will. Nothing is true except insofar as its sense or purpose or meaning is expressed or carried out. Truth to the idealist is thus a construction, a process, an activity, a creation, an attainment. Such a notion applies with equal aptness to the thought of the, pragma of the pragmatist as to the ide idealist. So basically what I want to say here, commenting Royce's ideas on truth, is that he thinks that the truth is a, an, en a, a, an endeavor of interpretation. If we want to find the truth about a, a subject matter, what we have to do is work interpreting together and try to uh, reveal the relevant information that we will come across if, our, if, if this will lead us to further action that will um, guide us to more and more signs. So basically, how do I know when I'm being mistaken? Because I'm cutting communication, in other words. I'm cutting the process of interpretation. A lie, for example, is a way of cutting other people's interpretation because I'm blocking the road of future uh, practical expressions of a truth. So for, um, that's a, um, a pragmatic way of uh, understanding how truth works. So three characteristics of Royce Royce'n pragmatism. So in first, interpretation is a mediating principle. Second, God is a pragmatic postulate. This is important for him because uh, communities need powerful ideas to do powerful things. And three, community uh, is perfective of the individual. I could go on to each of these topics, but I actually want to go on to, on to the third one this time only, because uh, what, what I want you to be persuaded of with the talk is that what Royce wants to tell us is in interpreting myself as an individual, I need a community. If I don't have a community of interpretation, the interpretation of my own self it will be uh, come to, will come to a halt. Except for example, how do I know if I'm a loving person? If I want to define myself as a loving person, how do I know that? Well, I have to exchange interactions with other people, and then I will know whether I'm a loving person or a hateful person, for example. Uh, how do I know I'm a patient person? Well, uh, I could define myself as patient. Ooh, I'm very patient, but I just don't, I can't stand people. Then you're not patient. <laughs> you, you, you can discover your, your own traits, your own individuality, only if you discover, uh, well, only if you put them into action in the interaction with others. But this is just, the, you know, characteristics of our personality. But we could go further and say, what is the meaning of my own individuality? For, so for example, where, if I want to build a project, you know, a professional project for my life, do I have only to take on account my own success? What do I want to have? So for example, how oh, I want to be rich, wealthy, loaded. <laughs> OK, and, and that will, will you success them? Will you, ha will you succeed then when you have that? Probably, let's see. Well, you might as well get you know, the money you want and everything, but actually you will know that your project is only limited to an interpretation of you when, when you have means to do things, but you don't do particular things because you just, you just only have the means. And what happens when I do my personal project in, in order to have an, a, a, a sharing ideal, a sharing ideal with a with a community. Uh, then my, my my own individuality starts to come to the light, because I start realizing that I have a sense of purpose that goes beyond my own, that considering myself as the only and sole end. When I consider the other people as ends and the community as an end, as a common end as a common good. 
then I start to realize the, the true significance of my own individuality. So for example, when, when do we say that a person flourishes? When the, all the capabilities come to, a, to, 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 to blossom into particular traits. But for example, how do I know uh, if I'm a successful person uh, flourishing in the traits I have in my own personality? Well, I will only know if I have a genuine interaction with others that is, takes the others as ends and not as means, for example. So just to just, just try to put an example, what's the relevance of this? Uh, in investigating these three teams, he accented, accent, sorry, accented in the explication of those which indicated an orientation towards future experience. In other words, pragmatism is a philosophy oriented to the future. And in this case, to building communities. The third trait of his pragmatism is, what do I want pragmatism for? To build a better community. According to Roy's interpretation, is essentially a social affair, like we said, and entails actions such as continuous translation. Roy uses the currency exchange to illustrate what happens when people communicate. Interpretation is needed to reinforce a community of mutual understanding and every human progress ultimately depends on the communication between individuals and generations. So, in conclusion, everything that each man needs is also needed by the communities of interpretation. Now, but, of course, um, when we want to identify if, it's, if a, a, an individual will flourish in a particular community, we need to realize first and foremost, if that community is actually a genuine community. And I don't have the time to explain the details of this, but what Royce wants to tell us is that no, there are many fake visions of individuality because also there are many fake visions of community. So for example, um, this didn't exist at the time, obviously, because he's previous to World War II. He was a pacifist during World War I. But in World War II, for example, we have the example of what Germany did uh, with the Nazi party. Uh, so the Nazi party will tell you that you have to, the ideal is Germany, okay? Uh, and in order to achieve this ideal, you have to exterminate other people. So, for example, the Jews. I'm exaggerating this, obviously, it doesn't say quite like that, but I just want to, to show you that some wrong ideals don't form a community. What they form is a loyalty that is a partial. And if a loyalty is to be genuine loyalty, then it has to be loyalty to loyalty. Now, I'll explain that in a second. This is a phrase that comes from Royce. What is loyalty to loyalty? So basically, what um, just, just to summarize, and we, we're approaching the end now, uh, but just to summarize what Royce wants to tell us is that if we want to really form a genuine community, we need a genuine ideal that can cement the interpretation of the community and the individual all together. And this cement or this binding agent is a powerful idea. And the most powerful postulate he could find was the concept of loyalty. Now, loyalty to what? He says, loyalty to loyalty. He said, like, what? Explain us that, please, Royce. Well, what Royce wants to tell us with his uh, idea of loyalty to loyalty is that we, one has to be loyal to the good itself, to the good of the community for the sake of the good of the community, for the good of humankind for the sake of humankind being an end in itself. We don't want to be good to humans because they will give us things back and that will build community. No, no, we want to give things to humans because humans are worthy beings and it's a good thing that they flourish as persons. And because of that, communities ha have to grow by the sole sake of the good itself of considering the community as an end in itself. But the community um, in another, in one of his late 
books that is called the great the hope of the great community what uh, Royce wants to do is show us that we have to look at ourselves as humanity as a big community and not only account for our present community but account for our future community community the communities we want to exist so in a way for example uh, w just to just to illustrate with one example Royce will tell us that if we wanted to create be loyal to our future communities we have to care for the environment because we want to inherit the, the means of a future community and if we all only act for our selfish purposes for the community present in this moment right now and not accounting for future communities what we're doing is not loyalty to loyalty it's just loyal as a partial loyalty that eventually will end up in a fake view of community and of course a fake view of the individual so the selfish individualistic consumerist attitude is one of the is one of the fake loyalties that um, Royce wants to criticize because he thinks that when we offer our loyalty to a fake cause to a not not a genuine cause but a fake one what we do is we forget about loyalty to loyalty so in Royce's own words true loyalty is something of this kind a cause is good not only for me but for mankind insofar as it is essentially a loyalty to loyalty that is an aid and furtherance of loyalty in my fellows it is an evil cause insofar as despite the loyalty that it arouses in me it is destructive to loyalty in the world in the world of my fellows so for example being loyal to the nazi party is not a genuine loyalty because in the world of my fellows in the world of other humans this is destructive of their community of their beings of the individuals so the, the now i'm going to do a, a little summary of, of what i want to to say to conclude now um, so what royce is telling us is that we need a systematic way to account for communities a way that could help us to have a, a, a solid foundation of our communities but in order to do that it's not it's not good enough to have sociological theories of, of how communities are this is just the descriptive work we want prescriptive work description is saying the things as they are prescription is saying the things as they should be so what we need is a prescriptive theory and only philosophy can give us that kind of material and because of that coming back to what uh, Peirce was fascinated about sorry Royce was fascinated about Peirce he wants to find that in the logical system of science and he finds that in order for a sign to generate unlimited interpretation towards the final interpreter of community an individual what we need is a very powerful idea and the idea he came up with was this idea of considering loyalty to loyalty which which is translated as considering humanity as a big community and our place in life as a result of our relationship with that ideal community that has to be built by particular individuals in a and given communities in a, a, at any time so I hope I didn't bore you too much with it but the point of it is saying that there are ways there are ways of constructing community in a systematic manner and, and it also allowed to come together different disciplines such as ethics sociology uh, philosophy metaphysics and semiotics in this case but also to understand each other better for a bigger purpose and because of that integrate harmonically all human knowledge so for example psychology um, and science as, as, a, as a, an activity that serves community so and just the last example so let's think about uh, subjects as bioethics why do we do bioethics ultimately because we want to put sci we use science and there's relationships 
of scientific inquiry generate questions about how to treat humans, how to treat uh, the human life, etc., etc. And the only way to generally answer to those questions is to put them in the context of what science is for a community. If we do science without the purpose of serving the humans that do the science, we are forgetting about the purpose of science, and so we are uh, rendering science uh, a little bit lost, actually. And we are losing interpretation that could give us more and genuine and valuable science. Thank you for your attention, and sorry for taking so long with this. Thank you, and if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to go ahead. Remember, pushing the button turns it a little light green. Everybody online can hear you. I'll start with the only online question we've got so far. Um, they're asking us if uh, your book is available. Are you selling it? Is there some place they can obtain it? Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Doing more adverts today. Thanks a lot. Well, the book, um, I have some books um, that are more theoretical in nature, but this kind of reflection can be uh, found in books such as this one that is a, a more um, sort of reflective stance on the value of community. Um, so for example here the girls who, my students who wrote this, they, 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 they ask this question, what is a school? Is an institution or a community? and what is better to have in school, values or virtues. Uh, so those valuable uh, considerations can be found here, and the book is for free in the website of Glasstree, which is www.glasstree.com. And if you go to the catalog, the e-book, the, the, e the electronic book, is free for download uh, with no cost, which you only have to register in the website. Um, but if you wanted a token of it, uh, in, you know, a printed token, uh, you could contact me and I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it reach you, wherever you are, person who is asking for it. <laughs> and uh, my, my email, I could say, it, or we could put it in the website later, and you can contact me and I can try to, to make uh, one of them reach to you. Uh, at no cost, because we only want to, uh, you know, um, promote these kind of ideas. I think it's on. Uh, more than qu well, thank you very much. But uh, Thanks, more than questions, I was kind of thinking of examples. But if you could clarify if I got it right. Um, so the, it, at the beginning of uh, your intervention on Josiah Royce. Um, uh, translation between different sets of songs, and I was I was thinking of that monologue in um, the Merchant of Venice, mm -hmm. when uh, the King of Morocco is um, of Morocco, and then the the King of Aragon mm -hmm. um, meet Portia, and you know they give these long, um, essentially displays of power because they want to marry her. But the end game is that they have to discover in which of three caskets is Portia's picture. Mm -hmm. And she has a, a silver, a gold, and a lead one. Mm -hmm. Morocco goes for the gold, uh, sorry, for the silver, and then Aragon goes for the gold, because they're wrong. And inside of each one of those caskets is another symbol, another sign, we could say. Um, one of them has a, uh, a skull, and the other one has a mirror. Now, <clears throat> the immediate reaction, of course, we're thinking about drama, so it really depends on the interpretation of the actor. But right before uh, the, there's a reaction from Portia, both of them react negatively to what they received. Mm -hmm. uh, could this be a good example of using different sets of signs and having to like, mutually understand them? Or did I completely miss the point? No, no, no. I think I think you got it right there. It's a very fascinating example. It's very complex indeed because the the, the drama of of Shakespeare is is always ma it has many layers of of symbols <laughs> indeed, and and of course uh, if he, he, what, what he's explaining there are like the deep human emotions that are there, the recognition of the other. 
you know, one of the things that immediately came to mind when, when you were saying this is that uh, basically what the, the king of Aragon and, and the key, Aragon and the king of um, Morocco, what they want to achieve is not the love of Portia, they just want to find themselves. They're just looking after themselves, and that's why they cannot recognize her in the other signs. Because if they were to know her as she is, then she'll, they, they genuinely look the other as an, as an end. So it's a funny, it's a fascinating example, I think, because it, it, it really tells us that halting the conversation, halting mm -hmm. the mutual interpretation, is when you stop seeing the other as the end, as a, as a valuable person, and you're just looking for yourself on the other person. And, well, people who study, you know, romantic relationships can can also tell a huge deal about these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But it also happens in a day-by-day in -day basis, doesn't it? I mean, when, when, when uh, the, the, the lack of recognition is the beginning of error. This, the, the act of stopping interpretation and just uh, clinging into a particular, tenaciously to a particular interpretation of things uh, against the evidence will lead us to error. And this is fascinating because it's, it's, um, it, it really stops the, record, the, the, the interpretation, you know. Uh, and Perth had this saying that the only commandment in the city of inquiry <laughs> is do never uh, block the road of inquiry. And in other words, what Royce will say of this is do, do never, never block the road of interpretation. Because when you choose for a selfish mean, or you choose for an, indiv uh, 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 an interpretation of things that closes openness to continue the, the process of interpretation, what you do is you, is you break the interpretation altogether, and you break with community, and you break with yourself in, in, so, in some way. So you know, I think this is a fascinating, well, we, we could talk for hours about this, but yes, I, I agree this is a fascinating example. I, and I see it, it I interpret the, the, the merchant of Venice as trying to tell us that genuine love has, has, has the other as, me, as, as end, not, not as a mean. And because of that, the, the common act of conversation that is love, romantic love, for example, actually signifies growing in, in knowing each other in a deeper way because the other is an end always and it's a stop when the other becomes a mean and so so for example a couple is a community it's a germinal community because what what they do is interpreting each other in a common project of life and what they do is generate a conversation that carries on and produces life produces further interpretations in things that they didn't even expect, it, for example. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> you have a... Okay, I'll be brief in my okay. response to have a space for everyone. Uh, so uh, the second one is what would be according to, um, especially dealing on voluntarianism, but of course, if you, do you have a comment here on what uh, Paris would say, is what is the role of prophecy in community? Mm -hmm. And sorry, it was entirely brought about by the book that you have there sitting, because in chapter 10, there's <laughs> the song of the Lord of Silver Fountains, which you know I have read quite have, um, many times, Dr. The Hobbit. <laughs> Book and here in, in that chapter, there is a song which actually begins and ends with a prophecy mm -hmm. given by one community, which in the case of the, the story there would be the people of, of the Long Lake, mm -hmm. uh, towards yes. another community which created it in a different time with a different purpose, which would be the uh, dwarves of uh, the Lonely Mountain. And yes, I am a fan of literary examples, but this thing of that you have a prophecy dealing you know, with one community and it's being interpreted by another one. You know? <laughs> and of course, I mean, this has a big corollary in religion, you know? but it probably be a little bit too extensive to deal with right now. But how does prophecy work in, according to, to Royce and Peirce? 
Okay, okay, well, <laughs> Whew, that's a very deep question. <laughs> well, um, in this book, once again, to do another advert, uh, chapter 10 is on um, another pragmatist writer who is called George Herbert Mead. And George Herbert Mead is famous for creating a theory called, uh, in sociology called uh, symbolic interactionism. Um, basically, well, he, he, he did a, a number of contributions in that line. But his, this chapter is about his theory of time. And for us, um, and, and what I like to rescue from, from what Mead tells us about time is something that I, I believe Royce and Peirce would approve as part of their theory, is that time is not a succession of discrete moments. Like, like, in, a, like in, a, in a film, for example. In a film, a moment it doesn't ca cause the next moment, but there's just frames, you know, there's just different points of time. Exactly. So a continuous theory of time helps us to recognize that a community across time is, is connected. But, of course, this connection is not always evident. So, for example, our own lives. We don't see always our lives as connected. Sometimes we see our lives as successions of scattered moments. You know, for example, today I struggled to get up, okay. Um, but then I got happy because I, I uh, found a little bit of the, my favorite cereal on, <laughs> on the cabinet there. <laughs> but then I got sad because there was traffic in the way coming here. And if I see my life like that, it was just a succession of different kinds of moments. But sometimes when something important happens to us, so for example, people say that when they had a terrible accident, they see their lives as a, as a, as a unity. They see the, the, the story of their lives and try to understand why they are here. Um, th that kind of experiences give us unity to the whole. So of course, uh, time is always continuous, and it's better to have a theory of time that is continuous than discrete. And that, I think that is even proof in mathematics, in mathematics of the continuum. But uh, uh, we need s signs that help us to realize that. And prophecies are those kind of signs. So prophecies are signs that unite communities across time. So if I want to recognize myself in a, in a germinal community, then I appropriate that prophecy and I, I make it into a reality and the sign comes to a, a genuine interpretation. The fascinating thing of a prophecy is that a prophecy is not finished with the person who, with the prophet. It's actually finished with the community that actualizes what the prophecy says. So in a way, uh, so for example, we connect with our Jewish ancestors, for example, if we appropriate those promises that were made to Abraham or or, or Muslims, for example, they connect with the, with, the, with the original community of Islam if they connect with the, prophecy, the, pro, the promises that are given in the Quran, for example. So in a way, what the, 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 the prophecy is, is, is one of those powerful symbols that eventually render time as, a, as an opportunity of the development of community. And, but, but, but of course, a genuine prophecy is that the one that helps us to look back into loyalty. Because if it doesn't, maybe it's not. It's, it's probably it won't be that powerful sign for us. You have a question? Is it is yep. it green? It's yeah. Excellent. Thank you for this uh, um, very good presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, I want to I want to to take that concept of uh, prophecy in, in order to know that it's available to take that for discrimination for example mm. to use that uh, like the prophecy that is self uh, self um, I don't know um, if for, for example in this in this um, process of discrimination for example in Mexico mm -hmm. uh, the people um, at the end assumes uh, he's their inferior or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is available to take that concept in order to analyze these processes in Mexico, you think? 
Oh, yes, definitely. Um, so, for example, the fact of people being discriminated because of their social class, etc., mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of human conditions. Um, uh, yes, I will say that what Royce uh, gives us to understand that problem in a deeper way is an interpretation of what signs are being uh, stuck in misinterpretation. Okay. And what I can see straight away is that he will tell us that basically we lost loyalty to loyalty because we stopped being other humans as humans just because of something that it derives from their humanity and it doesn't define their humanity. So for example, if, if a person um, is uh, of a particular skin color um, mm -hmm. and is discriminated because of that, it will be a failed, it will be a break in the conversation, it will be a, a way to block loyalty to loyalty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because being loyal to humans means to be loyal to what makes us human. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, what makes us human is not the color of our skin or a social condition or etc. But uh, are sharing our human, human emotions, human ends, etc., etc. And because of that, it will be a failure in to form a community. What discrimination and racism and all these sort of of, of different um, forms of discrimination do is halt and break the formation of community, of genuine communities. Or we put, could put it even the other way around. If we want to form a genuine community, we will avoid taking a, a, a trait of humans as a human trait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because one thing is one characteristic I could have as a human. I could, I could have a very annoying voice, for example. <laughs> and you could say, oh, I hate to hear Paniel because of his annoying voice. OK, fair enough. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't listen to what I say. Mm -hmm. uh, so same goes for community. Community could have a particular idiosyncratic ways. So for example, we Mexicans uh, like to put chili and everything. Um, but this doesn't define what a, a community is, because we define that Mexicans as a particular project of what humanity wants to do in a particular culture. Mm -hmm. And that's what gives us value. But that is b broken when discrimination happens. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, we, we have to uh, overcome discrimination by the construction of a genuine identity of community. That is not based in human traits, traits of the human, but human loyalty to the humanity. Does that does that answer yep. the question? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And the second one is: uh, Can we find in Roy's uh, thought um, the keys to to recognize false communities? Yes. I think, for example, the the. The, the, the communication is broken when it's not uh, real communication. For example, in the case of a software, a free software, like the case of Ubuntu or something like that, they open the, the sources in order to improve or, or make better uh, contributions. <laughs> it's the, the opposite to uh, closed software or closed uh, co codex. Uh -huh. It's 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 the communication is broken because the software is, is already closed, is already made, and mm -hmm. there's enough communication. And the, and I think it's related with the concept of prophecy because people think about um, their their selves. I don't have nothing to do, nothing to say with this kind of closed mm -hmm. communication, mm -hmm. closed software. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like, I like the, the example a lot because it says to us that it, it could, it, the, the self-corrective character of programming can only happen if it's open to a community that will prove it in, the, in, in a pragmatic way. Yes, to, totally agree. And the construction of community is similar to that? Yes, I would say so. Yes, because, well, Royce tells us different things in different places. He has... Um, if I remember correctly, he has a, um, 
in a in a in a book called the world and the individual he has um different ideas of individuality that he exposes different ideas of individuality and finally ends up telling us what will be uh, after describing wrong ways of constructing the individual identity he finally gives us one that actually doesn't finish he just leaves it open and then towards the end of his life he starts writing more and more about community with the elements of semiotics and then he starts to tell us how communities uh, help the individual to give this genuine meaning but it also tells us how to identify when a genuine community is being constructed uh, it gives us even different kinds of biases mm -hmm. that can happen uh, and, and, and can uh, thwart the, the right construction of community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a comprehensive, pro sorry, there is a comprehensive theory. Okay. And according to Royce, Royce follows Peirce in one respect as well as the other ones that I presented here. Uh, when Peirce talks about the community of inquiry, he says that there are three virtues that will help us. Hope, uh, which has theological back virtues, hope, faith, and charity. And Royce uh, appropriates this and says yes. And this can this also true for the for the development of community. A community that has hope, a community a genuine community will have evidence of having hopes, ideals, of having a uh, faith this is a, a, a powerful system of symbols and of having charity, a recognition of the other for their own value. Uh, and, and what destroys, he put, I, and I finished that uh, response just saying this. He has a, a very touching example that to me to, is, it has been very, very important in my everyday life. Um, you know, we, 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 we we have um, in, an, in our everyday lives, we, we coexist with a lot of misery in, in, in countries like ours, which is, you know, where there's like spread poverty and everything. And it's easy to be oblivious to people in, in a explicit need next to us. You know, we go walking down the street and it's easy to, you know, to, to construct our ideas by or, 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 or the picture of ourselves in the world, um, just bracketing this person as if it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I just walk past, and, I, and at some point I stop. I, 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 I'm becoming so very good at ignoring people that at some point I become oblivious of their existence. What Royce tells us about that is that if we, want, if we, if we really want to construct a genuine community, the first step is to start looking about. Mm -hmm. Say, who is the one that I have learned to be oblivious of? Who is this person that I am becoming very good at ignoring? And from there, I have to, that's the, only, that's the, that's the first place where I have to start building the community. And that's the value of charity. Charity is recognition of the one that you have become oblivious of. And of course, he has a, and you have a, a human duty to, to be loyal to him or her. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much for your patience. <laughs> Thanks. Ah, thank you ever so much. That's very nice. Thank you very much. Ooh. Time here. Just a, Ooh. a little recognition, a thank symbol. You. Your, Thanks uh, ever so much. Thank you so much. Thank you your investment here. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Very Thanks nice. Everybody. Thank you. Thank I'm you everyone for coming. You and more uh, and more of these events. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your patience as well. All right. We could spend yes. 92 hours talking. <laughs> it's very interesting stuff, isn't it? Nice. Despierta. ¿Sabes qué día es hoy? Vas a transformar al mundo haciendo lo que amas. Vas a cambiar las reglas del juego. Vas a mover a otros. Busca. Crea. Innova. Vuela. 
el mundo te espera. Transformar. Hazlo UPAE.